Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving? Overjoyed, departed. Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. No other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ King, me kingdom are you sighing. Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You know other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. All right, remain standing. The teenagers can go downstairs. 
We're going to sing a cappella 147, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <clears throat> I'm going to try not to start you off on the wrong key. This will be our special tonight. We'll just see how special it is, all right? Something tonight, Hunter. 147, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Ready? What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms on the third. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to First Thessalonians chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I don't know if we'll go all the way through 1 Thessalonians, but I uh, want to visit chapter number 2 this evening. And um, towards the end of the chapter, as we mentioned before, in, in 1 Thessalonians, every chapter makes reference to the coming of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the coming of the Lord. And when everything is made uh, right for the Christian, for the believer. I know in this world it's going to be an awful place. I'm glad that I'm not going to be here, but that is the blessed hope of the Christian is to, to look for the Lord's return. And it's good to be reminded. It's also good to be settled about what's going to happen when the Lord does return. What, what am I going to go through? What, what's going to happen to me as a Christian? And uh, i tell you this, all the troubles are behind us then. Everything is good and glorious and we're with the Lord bodily. Um, and what a blessing that is. That at the end, verse number 19 of chapter 2 says, What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well, about the soul winner's crown and uh, <clears throat> how you can have a time of rejoicing. Don't, what, don't you want to meet the Lord with something to give back to Him, something to praise Him with? I don't want to show up empty-handed. I want to bring as many with me as I can. So um, that's, that's what the, tonight's message is about. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would be with Master Club downstairs and the teen class downstairs and pray that you'd be with us upstairs, that you'd help us. And for the next few moments, remove all distractions from us, prepare our hearts for the message. And Lord, help me, fill me with thy spirit. I may say the things that are right and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 1. It says, before we start there, let's, we know that the expectation of the uh, believer is the Lord's return, right? That's what we're expecting. Chapter 1, verse 10 says, And to wait for His Son from heaven. We're looking for Jesus, who he, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So you and I know that we are delivered from the tribulation time that's going to come on this earth. We're delivered from that wrath that's going to come. The, uh, our future is we will be raptured out of here. 1 Thessalonians 4, towards the end part of that chapter, talks about us rising up in the air when the Lord shall uh, descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the, last, and the trump shall sound and uh, the church will be taken up out of here. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And uh, what a blessing that is. And then at that time, uh, there will be seven years of tribulation here. Well, what will you and I be doing? It will be the judgment seat of Christ where you and I will stand before the Lord and will give an account for the things that are done in our body. Whether there will be dead works that will be wood, hay, and stubble that will be burned up or it will be uh, works that we've done for the Lord with the right motive in, in the right spirit and those things will be abiding and uh, God will reward us for what we've done. 
Isn't that something that God has saved us, good for nothing sinners, and then He's promised to reward us for living for Him and uh, serving Him. And, and so we'll either have gain or loss during this time. Then there'll be the marriage of the Lamb. And then we'll come back with the Lord uh, when He comes to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. Uh, so that will be, that's an interesting time period. I don't know what I would be doing. I don't know what you will be doing. I often wonder if we will be able to come back to Pax, Pax Branch, and just uh, maybe we'll give a little bit of a, uh, authority over here. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. Uh, but it'll be, it'll be um, good nonetheless. We'll enjoy it. We'll have a, have a wonderful time. And then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. We'll forever be with the Lord. So it remains yet to be seen what God has in store for us. So He is the God of eternity. He is, um, we, we can't understand it. We can't fathom it. And I think that's why God has not shown that to us because uh, we, we just can't comprehend that. You know, in the Old Testament, the prophets, they foretold of the Lord's uh, coming, but they couldn't see the time frame between His first coming and second coming. Um, that God didn't reveal that to them. They, they did not need to know that. They may have gotten bogged down with the details. I don't know. But in, in God's foreknowledge, he, he did not see fit to let them see the time period of the church. Well, likewise, you and I, we know what's coming, but all the blessings in between and all the things that's going to happen to us uh, when we get to the new heaven and new earth and the millennial reign, He's given us just a little taste of it uh, so we can know what to expect. And we're going to be with the Lord. Um, I, Brother McBride has often said, going home to be with the Lord in heaven is, is, is just that. It's going home. When you think about going home, you think about all the wonderful memories that you have at home. I think about the uh, wonderful, I think about Christmas time. Uh, he may have even mentioned that too, I don't know. But you go home and you, and you get this uh, smell of uh, fresh baked goods and uh, fresh baked cookies or fudge or some, something else that somebody has made. And um, you're gathering together as a family, you've got good memories. That's what heaven is going to be like without all the, the, the other things that go, that go along to detract from that. Heaven's going to be wonderful, be a, a homecoming, a reunion uh, that will, will never end. So looking forward to that. So we're expecting the Lord to return. We're waiting on Him, uh, but we aren't to be just sitting idly by. Uh, we are to be busy. The uh, potential reward is called the soul winner's crown. It's given at the judgment seat of Christ. And it's for those that have, can, have brought somebody to Jesus a long life's journey. Okay, so that, and then matter of fact, that's what Paul says. He says, ye are, the, ye are my crown of rejoicing. Um, so let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 1. It says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with, with much contention. Let's take it a little bit out of time this evening. But the importance of the gospel message. Let's read through verse 4 because I, I want to get a, a thought for the first point. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. There's an expression in verse number 4 that says we were allowed to be put in trust with the gospel. Do you know that God has put us in trust with the gospel? He's entrusted us. When you give somebody, entrust somebody with something, you, you want them to take care of it, don't you? You want them to, uh, to, to make sure that they, no harm comes to it, that it, it fulfills the job that you've left for it to do. God has entrusted you and me with the gospel, to go and take a gospel, the gospel message to a lost and dying world. Paul understood that. He, look, look at the purpose that he came to the Thessalonians with. He said, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. He said, We came with purpose. We had a commission that we were, are, are, were going to fulfill. Before Jesus ascended, Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Amen. In Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and what? Preach the gospel to every creature. Right. Preach the gospel to every creature. He gave them that commission. Then when he, before, right before he ascended, he said, After, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in all 
Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he's given us a commission to carry out the gospel to a lost and dying world. Well, the gospel has power, right? Paul knew it had power. In Romans 1.16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? Power of God unto salvation. And to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He said, we didn't come in vain. We didn't come empty. We came with a purpose, with a powerful message. We came not without effect. We saw the effect that this had on you. It, it wasn't received in vain. He said, you know what kind of entrance we had unto you. You know how we came in. You know how we were received. You know our conduct. We're going to look at the conduct that they had there. You know the effect that it had on you, the effect that it, it caused. They turned from idols to serve the living and true God. We learned about that in chapter 1. So it wasn't without effect. The gospel message is not given in vain. We've been out visiting, and I don't know how many places we hit the other night when we went out as a group from here Thursday evening. Um, however many places are over there, minus a couple maybe. The rain rained us out. But we didn't see fruit from everybody, but one person prayed and asked the Lord to save them. And we don't know what other fruit uh, may come from later. We planted the seed. God gives the increase. God does the water and God gives the increase. But, but the point is that it doesn't come back void. God will, said He would accomplish, uh, His Word will accomplish what He uh, sent it forth to accomplish. I'm a little tongue twisted tonight, so I hope the uh, thoughts will come out. Um, he said we came with purpose. But also, look, he said, we came with, with perseverance. Verse number 2, But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi. You remember what happened at, at Philippi? You remember the Philippian jailer? Um, they, Paul and Silas was imprisoned, and at midnight they sang praises unto God, and they prayed, and there was an earthquake. And all of that happened at Philippi just before they came to Thessalonica. What would have happened if they would have given up at Philippi and left? and said, it's not worth it, it's no use. Uh, Silas says, Brother Paul, I think we need to sing tonight unto the Lord. He says, Paul, what's the use? I said, well, I've served God and I've, all I've got is in this jail cell. But he didn't do that. He, his heart was right with the Lord. And uh, he said, there's a reason why God has, God has sent us. He sent us not to give up, but to give the gospel, to work until Jesus comes. Regardless of persecutions and afflictions and trials and whatever else may come, just work till Jesus comes. Paul and Silas both they lifted up their hearts unto the Lord earthquake, God moved in a great way, saved the Philippian jailer and his household. He said, we were shamefully entreated. You remember that, I think it was the, the, the magistrates had sent for Paul and Silas to leave, and he said, we're not going to leave just like that. We're not leaving privately. They condemned us and, uh, publicly. They need to come publicly themselves and bring us out of this jail cell. He said, it wasn't just a little bit of, of affliction. Look what the last part says. As you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So he left one city, they were they shamefully entreated, they had persecution there, went to another city, he had contention there. there it seemed like every place that Paul went, he had persecution come up against him, he had affliction come up against him. But did that stop him? No, that didn't move him, did it? Um, at to, to the very end, he was faithful to the commission that God called him to. He persevered. Even amidst persecution, amidst opposition, Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And I, I think about this. He said, we came with boldness. We knew we were going to probably suffer some opposition. We faced it before, but we've got a message worth telling. You and I have a message worth giving to this world. Um, and you know what? We've been, we've been well received where we've went. We've only been run off from a couple doors, and that's, that's normal anyway. It didn't have anything to do with the virus. It just had to do with the gospel. Um, but we've been well received. They, people have, have taken the cars, taken the, uh, the information. We've had an opportunity to present the gospel. And it's amazing how many people say that they're saved on their way to heaven. That's a whole other story. But um, God says just go and give the gospel. There's power in the gospel, but we've got to keep persevering. The devil is trying to attack, trying to hinder. He tried to hinder here, but just keep going, keep going. So the importance of the gospel, is it important? How many believe it's important? Believe it's important. It's how you got saved. It's how I got saved. He said, not only is it important, but we obeyed. We were obedient to the gospel message. It was entrusted to us, and then we delivered it. 
He said, we came through on our end. We fulfilled the responsibility. Verse number 4, let's read it again, get the context. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Jump back up, back up to verse number 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. He said, we delivered the gospel in sincerity. We were sincere about it. We didn't do it for our own personal gain, not for uh, deceit, not for tricking somebody into, into uh, believing the way that we believe or, or giving us anything. Uh, it says it wasn't out of uncleanness. We weren't out in it for personal pleasure. It wasn't in guile. It was no ill intent. So we were doing this because God sent us to do this. We were obeying God. And then later Paul says, we, you all were endeared to us. He had a heart for them. You and I will go, and we may not have the heart that we should have when we start, but God works on our hearts as we're going, as we're talking. He gives us that heart for those people. Say, oh, I would go, but I, I need a heart for it. Well, you go, and God will, will give you that heart for it if you're open to Him and willing to go. He says, we, with sincerity, we brought the gospel. Our, our simple motive was pleasing to God, not pleasing men. And you give the gospel, you won't please everybody that you talk with because the gospel is abrasive, isn't it? It tells you what a, a low-down, rotten, dirty sinner you and I are. How many of you like to hear how dirty and rotten you are? None of us do, do you? Um, it, it works against our ego. We think we're something. But um, the gospel works against that, but they, that's needed. The gospel says you need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior, and He can save you from your sins. We're speaking for God and not for men. Look at verse number 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. So verse number 4, God tries the hearts. God sees what our motives are. When we come to church, when we take a gospel message, gospel track to someone, he sees our hearts, he's witness to that, he sees our motive. Um, we can't hide that from God. I don't think we should let that stop us from going. Say, well, I don't have the 100% the, the pure, right motive. You go and ask the Lord to give you that motive while you're going. I, I think that that's the way to do it. I think you need to go in the right motive for the right purpose. But if you don't have the right motive and purpose... You go and ask the Lord to give that to you. Don't not go. Um, that doesn't make it right to, to not go. Does that make sense? Okay. Nor of men sought we glory, neither... I'm going to take silence as yes. So. Nor, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. He said, we, we are the apostles of Christ. We're the, God's messengers to you, uh, and we could have been burdensome to you. We could have over lorded you and, and caused you to give us every single need that we needed. We said, we came humbly. When you and I give the gospel, we ought to remember that we're nothing special other than a sinner saved by the grace of God. And I know some people will, will take offense to the gospel when it's given, and they'll say that you're coming across as goody two-shoes or, or better than thou, or holier than thou, as, as some people say. But the fault, let not the fault be with you. Let them say that. But you just go humbly anyway, realizing that you're nothing more than a sinner saved by the grace of God. And they're saying that just as, as an out for them. If you try to get an excuse for them to dismiss the gospel. Chances are it has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with Jesus. That why they are pushed off by the gospel. Okay, so um, with sincerity they went. With simplicity they went. They said, we went as a servant, not as an as a apostle that's going to overlord. And, and, but we went as a servant. He said, look at verse number 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. It's uh, amazing to me to... You, of course, you go to the, when you could go to the hospital and, and see babies born and, and uh, go to the nursery and see the new babies and how the nurses take care of the babies. But... Uh, I think of how the mother, the new mother, takes care of the baby, how she cares, uh, a good mother, how she cares for the baby and loves the baby and treats the baby and doesn't let anybody near the baby unless they've washed their hands, disinfected, and, and they're good and clean. Um, she takes care of that baby. She, it, Paul's saying, just like that, we came unto you. We, we were cherishing you. We didn't want anybody else to, to uh, come in with false doctrine and false gospel. We, we loved you as a little baby, and we wanted to see you grow and uh, be nurtured and, and discipled in the way of the Lord. He said, verse number 8, 
So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto, uh, unto us. See the motive? Does that not remind you of a new, new mother? It remind you of, of a, not just a new mother, but any mother, um, that she would be willing to give of herself for her children. There are, uh, there's a, a special connection between mother and children. Fathers would be willing to give of themselves as well, but there is a unique bond between mothers and children. And he's saying that we, weren't, we were, didn't want just to give you the gospel, we were willing to give ourselves also so that you would have what you needed. As you see the compassion that they took with them. It's, uh, it's interesting to note that when Jesus lived on, on this earth, walked this earth for, for three and a half years in his public ministry, he would come upon a need. The Bible would say he was moved with compassion. He was, his body was tired. He was physically worn down because he, he was robed in human flesh. His, his human flesh uh, would wear down and, and get tired just the same, but his, his heart uh, was still moved with compassion toward those that needed help. When I get tired, I don't want anybody near me. I just, I just want to be left alone. Anybody else like that? Good, a couple of you. Um, but we ought to work on that, shouldn't we? We ought to go with the uh, gospel message, with compassion in our hearts towards those that uh, need somebody to tell them that Jesus cares, Jesus loves them. Really, that's what the, the answer is. It's what people need to know that Jesus cares. That's hard to do sometimes, but that's, that's what we need to do. Humbly, lovingly, as a nurse, uh, cherisheth her children. Selflessly, we were willing to give our own souls. He says, you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Turn, turn, hold your place here, and turn with me to Ezekiel chapter number 3. Ezekiel chapter number 3, verse number 17. While you're turning, I'll go ahead and start. You can listen. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. See what God is telling the prophet here. He's saying, I want you, if I give a warning for you to give, and you don't give it, and thou givest him not the warning, and then the, the wicked man dies, he will die in his sins. I'm still going to require it of him, but I'm also going to, going to lay blood to, to your hands. He says, his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. In other words, I'm not going to lay it to your account. He's still going to die in his own sins, but you gave the message. You did what I was telling you to do. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I acquire at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. So, the same thing for a righteous man. If you tell a righteous man, after he's, he's turned and he's done something uh, sinful, and you, you tell him, you don't tell him, then you're going to, uh, I'm going to lay that against your account, but if you do tell him, regardless of what he does, you've discharged your duty, you've done what I've asked you to do, and I'm not going to lay that to your account. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, we didn't want to be chargeable to any of you. We wanted to make sure that every one of you knew the gospel, knew uh, the, uh, the gospel message. He said, we wanted to be complete with it. He said, night and day, no one missing, nothing lacking. That takes work, don't it? That takes a lot of work. You remember that the Apostle Paul, uh, for his occupation, was a tent maker. He, he did some tent making to help uh, fund his journeys, fund his, his living, and I'm sure there were those that took care of him, but like he said, he said, I, I, was not, I wasn't burdensome to you. I don't believe he took much from the people that he went to, uh, to, to uh, minister unto. So he had to furnish his own, own goods. Here's what I'm saying. He was busy working, but even though he was busy, he still went and gave the gospel out. 
as often as he could, as opportunity presented itself, he gave the gospel. He did not want to be chargeable for, for them. Verse number 10, he said, I don't, I don't want to be uh, blamable. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. He said, when I gave you the gospel, I didn't want it to be of none effect. Now, you and I know, when we go to give the gospel, tell somebody, hey, uh, uh, do you know that Jesus loves you? He died on the cross for your sins. <clears throat> you can be forgiven of your sins. Some of the reaction that you get, have you ever got this reaction? Well, what about those hypocrites at church? Some variation of that. I've, I've got that. And um, there's, there's some interesting remarks you can make. I don't know that I'd recommend it. But, um, but I, the first thing that pops in my mind the first thing that pops in my mind is, well, one more won't hurt them. You won't hurt us. Um, but you don't necessarily want to say that. Uh, the things that go through this mind sometimes. But um, here, here's, here's what I'm saying. Is that even though, I don't, know, I, I don't know where I was going with that now. I don't know. I don't know. Here's where I was going with that. People see, people see, professing Christians, whether or not they are truly converted, born-again Christians, that's between them and the Lord, but they see professing Christians not living the way that they, they ought to live. And it is an excuse, it's not a good excuse, but it is an excuse to get them out of the gospel, out of that conviction, um, but they'll still have to answer for their sins. But when you and I go, we ought to not have a lifestyle behind us that doesn't match up what we're preaching and, and, and trying to teach them with. Does that make sense? We ought to not have so much uh, with us. Uh, and Forget the past. I mean, I'm talking about right now. God has forgiven the past if you've confessed it, gone under the blood. Like right now, if you're uh, walking with the Lord, then you have a better testimony to back up the message that you're going to give. He said, we didn't want to be blamable to you. We lived holy. We lived justly. We lived unblameably. We behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Now he's using the analogy of a father caring for his children. He said, we wanted you to grow in the Lord, mature in the Lord. Look at verse number 12, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now, does that, does that phrase uh, sound familiar? It, it should. You may not know where, but turn with me to Colossians chapter number 1. Read, you can read that verse again. I'll read it while you're turning. That ye should walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Master Club, coming in handy again. Colossians chapter number 1, it says, verse number 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. Uh, verse number 11, strengthen with all might. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his, his dear Son. So he's saying basically the same thing he told the Colossians. He's telling these uh, Thessalonians, it, it seems to me that it, it was on the heart of Paul to help his new converts to grow in the Lord, to uh, walk worthy, for them to be able to find what God's will for their life is. You know, I'm glad that God has showed me the next step to take for my life, but I want you to know too what, what this next step is for your life. That takes prayer, that takes Bible study, it takes sitting under uh, good Bible preaching, and sometimes it takes uh, prayer together, godly counsel. Um, whatever it is, we want to make sure that you know what God's will for your life is. And he's saying, that, that, that was on my heart, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto His kingdom and glory. He wanted them to know, listen, God's got a purpose for your life. And I know we tell the young people that all the time, and it's true, I believe it with all my heart. I try to tell them as much as I can, God has a purpose for their life. How many of you believe that, our young people's lives? I believe that. You know what I also believe? That God's got a purpose for your life too. And uh, we won't kid ourselves. We're not as young as we used to be, right? Um, the back pains from playing dodgeball show us that. And uh, they say, what are you talking? You're still a young whippersnapper. Well, I know, but I'm still not as young as I used to be. I still... Uh, can't keep up with, can't keep up with everybody like I used to. But you know what? God's still got a purpose and a plan. He's not done with us, even though our bodies wear out. He's still not done with us. He still has a plan. So what is that plan? Well, you we find that God, God wants you to know what that is, so you can follow Him in it. It's verse thirteen. 
For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He said, you received it not as, as the word of men, but it was the word of God. We, we're given the word of God right here. God used men to pin it down, but this is the very words of God. He gave them the words to speak. I believe that with all of my heart. This is the word of God. You can trust it. You can depend upon it. You can arrest your life and soul on it. So not just for salvation, but, but daily living. Your, your counsel, what to do next with your life. All right. Verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which, is, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. You see, uh, the gospel produces a change. It also produces a, a linking. They're linked to other churches through suffering. I'll tell you what, this, um, what COVID has done inadvertently. It has linked us with other fellow churches. Because we're all trying to, to navigate through this together. Suffering, persecution will link churches together, Christian brothers and sisters together. He said there's also a linking because of the family relationship. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and and there's, there's, we can encourage and help one another. Look at verse number 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. You see the Apostle Paul's heart here? He said, we wished we could have been there and seen your face and gone with these, uh, uh, through these tribulations and trials with you, he said, but we couldn't. But we endeavored to. Look at verse number 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. So the devil hindered our coming again unto you. You know, the devil is able to hinder us sometimes. You know what he's not able to hinder, though? Chapter 1, verse number 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Not one time did, was the Apostle Paul's prayers hindered by Satan. And, God, and the devil will not hinder your prayers either. He may hinder you from going and telling somebody about the Lord, but He won't hinder your prayers. Uh, God can reach somebody that you cannot reach right now. And just keep praying. That opportunity may open up again. We find in chapter 3 that he was, Paul was able to send Timothy back. And uh, so that was a blessing. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? All that to say this, and we're done. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. The gospel has been entrusted to us. It's important. There's power there. That's how a person gets converted, saved, born again. It was entrusted to us. We ought to take it and give it out. But then there's also the rewards of the gospel message. It, it's profitable. Number one, we'll be pleasing to the master. Don't you want to hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? I do. Number two, the crown of rejoicing. And whether it's a literal, literal crown, whether it's just the people that are here with us that we've led to the Lord, that we've uh, shown, pointed to the Lord, and God has saved them. Philippians 4, and it doesn't matter. Uh, we're we rejoicing with them in the presence of the Lord. Philippians 4, 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He said, these that I've won to the Lord, that I've led to the Lord, pointed to the Lord. He said, this is my crown of rejoicing. This, this is, is what I'm working for. This is why I labor night and day. He said, when I see a person saved, that that's a rejoice, rejoices my heart. That stirs my heart. Psalm 126 6 says it like this. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You go and give the seed. God's, God's word will not return void. You plant a seed, God will give the increase. And, and let's say that it is a, a literal crown that God gives us one day for a, a soul that's saved. We're going to turn right back around and give that back to the Lord. We know that. We're going to worship Him with it. Wouldn't you like to have something to give back to the Lord? And, and not, um, I forget how that song goes, but not with one soul with which to greet Him. The crown of rejoicing, my joy and crown. He said, 
are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ this coming. Think about, think about this. Wouldn't you love to have your family there with you? Those that are still, those are still living that you have the opportunity to tell the gospel message to, bring them with you. Um, that's, that's why we're pushing hard towards this God bless America rally so we can get as many people to go with us to heaven. I believe the Lord is coming soon. I believe that. Um, so let's get as many as we can to go, to go together, to go with us. I'd encourage you to read this in one setting, this chapter, chapter 2 in one setting, so you get the context and the flow and how everything goes. And when you read it, look at the apostle's heart, his heart for the people, how he was moved because he cared for them and he wanted to be pleasing to his master. Persecution wouldn't uh, dissuade him. Uh, opposition wouldn't stop him. Even the hindrances of Satan was overcome by his prayers. He'd, he'd pray unto God for those that he couldn't reach. And then he was looking and waiting for the Lord Jesus to, to return. You know, I ought to be doing the same. Amen? All right, let's stand with head bowed and eyes closed.